Thank you. Thank you for having me. Why don't we start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God and Father, through the intercession of St. Gregory Nazianzus, we pray, pray that you would be with us this night. Send your Holy Spirit among us to illumine our hearts, our minds, purify our hearts that we might comprehend your truth. We pray especially that you would put within our hearts an urgent desire to love you, to serve you. And may all that we do and say this night and throughout this week be for your greater glory and for the salvation of souls. And we ask this as all things in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Just a little correction to the intro. I was actually born in Pittsburgh at McGee Women's Hospital. And, uh, but I did uh, uh, graduate from high school in a little place called Westmont Hilltop uh, in Johnstown. Is that where you're from? Yeah. Oh, great. What year did you graduate? <laughs> Before you. <laughs> Before me. I don't know. I've, I got a lot of gray hair here. Okay. I've only been within the Eastern Rite uh, since the summer. And so it's a recent thing for me, but it's been a long journey. Uh, I'd say over the last 30 to 35 years, I've been immersed in the study of the fathers. And when I was a novice of a community, I was given the Philokalia as a Christmas gift. The, for just the first three volumes were the only ones in print at that point. And immediately I was taken with it. There's something about the Eastern Fathers where they speak with a kind of clarity and with an eminent practicality. And for a young man, a typical college student, it was exactly what I needed. They went to directly to the internal struggle that we all experience as human beings, the struggle with our own sins, with those sins that have become habitual or passions, how it is that we seek to grow in virtue, how do we pray, and not only pray, but heed the call of St. Paul to pray without ceasing or to become prayer itself. So I devoured the readings as I found them. And we live in a wonderful time now because more and more has become accessible to us in the last 20 years. So many things that have never been published in English are now available to us to guide and direct us in the spiritual life. It's only been within the last 20 years that the great writer Saint Isaac the Syrian, uh, his writings, his ascetical homilies have been published in English. And the final, the fifth volume of the Philokalia has just been translated and due for publication very soon. So despite the fact that in our day and age we may lack spiritual elders, uh, we have accessible to us their writings uh, to guide us and direct us in the spiritual life. So we live in a, a beautiful time in that regard. And it's part of this that I want to share with you here this evening. As I said, it's been a long time in coming. And I've wanted to give this talk for a long time. Actually, it's the first time that I'll be presenting it, so I ask you to bear with me. I've presented, uh, prepared a little handout for you, just with an outline. We're unlikely to get through it, so don't worry. Uh, but uh, if we get through the first part of it, I will be very happy. Uh, there are some things, I think, that are essential about the spiritual life that can only come to us from the East. We often hear... Uh, people speak of the need for unification and for the church to breathe with both lungs. Well, it does. We have the Eastern Rites, and we have the distinct and unique theological, liturgical, and spiritual tradition at our fingertips. And yet it's often neglected, and we need to take hold of it. It's something that's truly transformative, and it's something that the church desperately needs. Often in spiritual battles, or uh, in reality, in life battles and warfare, sometimes it's the auxiliary companies that turn the tide. The smaller groups uh, of soldiers can change the, 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 the course of a battle. And so it can be true within the life of the church. Those who are truly immersed in the fathers, who have been transformed by it, who live their lives according to their teachings, can uh, enliven a parish, enliven a family. Uh, St. Philip Neri once said, if I had true, 10 truly detached men, I could convert the world. 
and he was right. If there were 10 men who were women, whose hearts burned for love of God, we could transform certainly our parishes, but uh, no doubt this entire city. So what I want to speak to you about this evening is interiorized monasticism. It might sound like uh, uh, not a very interesting topic, but I think it's the most important thing for us to be talking about these days for ourselves and our lives as Christians. What is it that can guide us to God? What is it that can transform our lives and to pull the faith life out of the mind, out of being something notional to something that's transformative? What we need in our day is not more programs, more talks, we need more saints. That's what will transform the life of the church. The question is, how do we get there? The early church went through great persecution, as you know, baptism by blood. To profess Christianity was uh, really to write one's own death sentence. And this existed throughout the, the first three centuries of the church. But once the church was accepted by the culture, we began to see not long after that, uh, 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 sort of a calling of the desire for God, a calling of that heroic kind of faith that led people to embrace the cross or great tortures for the sake of the faith. And it's at this time, especially after the rise of Constantine, that we see men and women moving out into the desert. And they did not go out there to create monastic communities. And there weren't monastic communities out there that existed. They went out there to be saved. They went out there to do battle, to struggle with the demons. The desert was known to be a place inhabited by them. So they went specifically into the desert to do best spiritual battle, not outside of themselves, but within their own hearts. There to be taught by the silence how to pray, to see the most important thing, where they needed to repent, the passions that held them in their grip, how to struggle with them. And so the ascetic life from that point on becomes central to the life of the church and it has been ever since. This monastic spirituality, the spirituality of the desert forever changed the psyche of the church this is our spirituality. This isn't something that existed 17, 1800 years ago. This is what we are to be living now. They went out into the desert to embrace a new kind of martyrdom, a white martyrdom, to die to self, to sin, and to live for God, and to offer their lives to him fully, it's to set aside every impediment that kept them from giving themselves in love and receiving the love of God. And so this is the spirituality that must guide us as well, even though we live in the city. And unfortunately, it's been something that has been set aside. What we find in our own day, I think, is a kind of hodgepodge of spiritualities. Wherever there is a void, something's immediately going to seek to enter into that and fill that lack. And so we find a multiplicity of modern spiritualities that typically pick from this or that saint or this or that charism, but nothing that is sustained that really speaks to us in terms of our formation as Christian men and women, and more importantly, our formation towards holiness. How is it that we embrace the gospel uh, in its completeness? How do we respond to Christ's call to follow me, to die to self and to sin, to be willing to be persecuted and hated by the world? How do we live the faith, not out at the margins, but really have it be the thing that shapes our life and our identity? And so the first thing I wanna get into you today is not even part of the notes. It's really the uh, essential aspect of the ascetical life. The church in essence is ascetical as it is creedal. It is a church of revelation. We believe that God has made himself manifest to us. In fact, he's taken our flesh upon himself. He's revealed himself to us 
as never before. The, the veil, uh, revelation means re velare, to draw back, to pull back the veil. And in sending us his son, he's done that completely, definitively. We are not waiting for something new to be revealed to us. All that God has re revealed for our salvation has been made known to us. It is for us to take hold of it, to take hold of the grace that is given to us, and to live a holy life, to conform ourselves to Christ. And one of the important ways to do this, as I said, is not only creedal, what we believe in our minds, what has been revealed to us, and professing that, believing that. We also believe that the incarnation is not something that ended with Christ's descent into heaven. That Christ is the sacrament of God, that he makes God present to us fully. And that the church is the sacrament of Christ that the church, his body, makes our God present to the world in an unparalleled fashion. And it's in and through the privileged means that God has given us, the sacramental life, the seven sacraments, that, that God draws us then into this relationship with him. It's here that he nourishes us, he feeds us, in order that we might be conformed to his son. And so we have specific concrete beliefs as Christian men and women. We believe Christianity is a revealed religion, that it's sacramental, it's ecclesial. We believe in the church, but we also believe that it's ascetic. That again, we do not live out our faith just in our minds, but through our whole person, through our whole being. Uh, asceticism simply means to exercise to exercise our faith. And this is something where I think we often get hung up. Asceticism is not a religious idea. It's part of being a human being. We are ascetical creatures, if you will. Anything that we love or give ourselves over to, we have to exercise ourselves in the practice of it. And just let me give you a few examples. A great athlete will often begin as a little child playing peewee football and he'll become enamored with it, fall in love with it. He'll engage in it over the course of time with the support of his family. He will join teams, he will practice, he will learn plays. As he ages, he will exercise, he will even control his diet. His life will begin to revolve around it in such a way that he gives himself over to it fully until he excels because he loves it. Whatever we love, whatever we desire, we give ourselves over to it fully. Maybe in a clearer way would be the artist or the musician. At the earliest and tenderest of age, they will take up something that they fall in love with, usually because uh, someone has revealed to them the beauty of it. And so a musician will fall in love with playing the piano or the violin. Uh, my two nieces, when they uh, were just little, three years old, I remember going to one of their concerts and seeing these three-year-olds march out onto the stage in front of a crowd of 600 people with their violin in hand, bow to the crowd, and then walk off the stage. <laughs> that was all that they had to do to teach them to be used to being in front of large people, a large group of people because they were going to have to eventually perform. And so to free them from that anxiety, simply walk out and bow. It was the funniest of things, but it, it makes sense. And the same thing with artists. You begin, you, you work in different mediums, you take lessons from masters, you read about it. Uh, you travel to other countries to see the way that they, they do art. Academia, all of us here, or many of us have, have higher degrees. So you, you begin your studies very early on. You begin to focus in on something that speaks to your heart that you love. You begin to pursue a higher degree. And with that is not only uh, the, the cost of money, but time, going to classes, studying, sitting at the feet of those who have an experiential knowledge of this subject, who have been at it for years, in order that we might pursue that same path. Think of the path of a physician, how many years they dedicate 
to that study in order that they could perfect it and then do surgery. Anything that we love, we will exercise ourselves and sacrifice enormous amounts of time, energy, money to pursue it. But for some reason, when it comes to our Christian faith and the spiritual life, we think it should be spontaneous, that we should be naturally inspired to live the life of virtue, that we should be naturally inspired to pray or to do the spiritual battle that we need. We know that we struggle not only with our own weakness, but we struggle against principalities and powers. So we struggle against demons who seek to draw us away from Christ and the path of holiness. So what is it that we are to do to enter into this? It is to embrace the ascetic life. Too often, as I said, our faith life is in our minds. It's notional. What we receive from the monastic tradition is praxis the practical aspects of living out the faith, of exercising our faith. And so it should be our, from our earliest childhood that our parents are teaching us what the, the spiritual tradition offers us in its fullness. There's uh, a young man, he started his own co company, it's called Creative Orthodoxy, and he writes children's books of these stories about the Desert Fathers and how they lived their life in order to expose them at a tender age to their faith. The same thing takes place in parishes where you have these young little servers who can only carry uh, battery lit light and they're vested and yet they process with the priest and all the other servers. That's where you begin to create that love for liturgy, love for the church, love for the Christ when they are surrounded by their families, their friends, and by the, the priests of the church, that they begin to understand that there is something special here, there's something beautiful that people are dedicated to. When it comes to the spiritual life, I would say my experience of that was nil. That uh, being exposed to the spiritual tradition was not something that happened in my life until I was in my 20s. I had never heard of the philokalia or the Desert Fathers. I'd never heard of the Chotki, the prayer rope, or the Jesus prayer, none of it. Except that I had a Russian Orthodox cousin who one day sent me the Ladder of Divine Ascent by John Climacus in the mail, unsolicited, along with a prayer rope. And that tr changed my trajectory permanently because it drew me right where I needed to be, where it was, where was, was in this exercise of the faith. How was I going to form a mind and a heart that had been completely unformed or deformed more by the culture that I had grown up in? And so regaining a sense of the importance of the ascetical life, of exercising our faith, of engaging in a spiritual battle, on a day-to-day -day basis, moment to moment, is essential for the life of the church. Again, no matter how many programs we have or books that people write or dinners that we have, it's not going to make a dent in this culture unless there are minds and hearts that are made pure who fall in love with Christ, who desire him. The word desire comes from desideratum, which means sense of lack or incompleteness. And part of what asceticism teaches us is that we are made in the image and likeness of God. He's created us for him. And that there is something from us missing. We are incomplete as human beings unless we are immersed in that relationship. Outside of it, we might have everything in this world we might ha be happy on an emotional level, but deep within ourselves, we know that there is something that is lacking. This is why even the most wealthy people in the world often find their lives to be very empty. Their relationships don't endure, no matter what they succeed, no matter how many accolades they receive from the world. Whereas the person who might be poor in the eyes of the world with a depth of faith knows the peace of the kingdom the joy of the kingdom. So whatever we expend in exercising our faith, whatever the cost of it, 
is absolutely worth it. And so if we weaken our bodies with fasting, if we weaken ourselves praying, burning the midnight oil, fine. It's about time that we did that. We never question or we never call individuals who love sports, the 100,000 people that fill uh, Penn State Stadium to watch a football game, they're called fans, but you know the word fan comes from fanatic. <laughs> Nobody would go in there and call them fanatics. We would call them lovers of football. But the moment someone begins to go to liturgy regularly, or say the hours, or pray the chotki constantly, pray the Jesus prayer constantly, who fast, who keeps vigils. St. John Christum said, you should get your kids up in the middle of the night, have them say a prayer, and then go back to bed. This is how you teach them how important it is to break the night in prayer and how powerful that is. You don't keep them up all night, but you show them the wisdom of the church, the wisdom of the spiritual tradition. And so there's probably more than a few of us here that have been accused of that, of being fanatical about our faith. And my own parents, when I came into the faith, worried, worried that I would be, who influenced you? Would, you, would I be happy through my life? And especially when I started thinking about the priesthood, that pushed them over the edge. Because <laughs> all these years I've been Latin right, and that meant no grandchildren. But literally worrying that I would be unhappy if I would take that path. And it betrays, I, I think, a lack of understanding, because they're men and women of faith. They were men, my father's since passed. But they're men and women of faith. And yet, it never held out something to them that became a source of peace. And not only peace, but invincible peace that nothing in this world and no one in this world can take away from us. When our hearts are fully given over to God, when we are immersed in prayer, we can be going through hell and yet still know the, the peace of the kingdom within our hearts. And we can keep moving. Winston Churchill said that, if you're going through hell, keep going until you come out the other side. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty, actually, it's pretty good counsel and pretty wise spiritual counsel as it is too. And so if you take anything away from this, it would be the centrality of the ascetical life for living out our Christianity. It's not something that is optional. It is essential to calling ourselves Christian men and women. And we are responsible for taking hold of that grace that is given to us through the sacraments and allowing it to bear fruit that is pleasing to God. This is why Paul says, if you eat and drink without discerning the body, you eat and drink to your own condemnation. If we are taking the Holy Eucharist as if it were a commodity, like anything else that we purchase and buy in this world, and that this is something that we just do as Christians because we think that we need it to nourish us, to help us get through life. That is not Christianity. We are to live from Eucharist to Eucharist, and the way that we live from Eucharist to Eucharist is by engaging in the ascetical life, by praying, by studying the scripture, going to liturgy, praying the hours, embracing the fullness of what the tradition offers us. Otherwise, our faith is going to stagnate and come, come to nothing. Sigmund Freud described faith as an auxiliary construction, a psychological construct, something that forms in the mind to make us feel secure in this world, this world that seems so ugly, so frightening. And because Freud was an atheist, we say, he's nuts. <laughs> Forget about it. But if we are really seeking the truth, we have to acknowledge he saw something. There's a lot that we would say no to Freud about, but this, maybe not so much. Because if we are not living our faith, if it has become for us like a comfortable old chair, a great pair of old jeans or shoes that have, are worn out but we would never throw away because they make us comfortable, then if our faith has become like that, it's an auxiliary construction. 
And if we pray a little bit in the morning, a little bit at night, we go to divine liturgy, we go to confession once in a blue moon, it's an auxiliary construction. Our faith life is to be something that is filled with desire and a sense of urgency for God. What God offers us is incomparable to anything within this world. And so an urgent longing should come over us. If you read, and this is an interesting thing, if you read through the Desert Fathers, and I think we're all, we often look at them as being these archaic figures who hated the body, who hated the world, who punished themselves, who are masochists. The exact opposite. If you read them, what you find emerging is the language of desire, that all that they are doing is out of desire and love for God, to remove every impediment within their heart to loving him and to loving others fully. And if their asceticism is not rooted in that, then it's in vain. They knew it. If they go out into the desert and they lose sight of that desire and love for God, they are the most pitiable of all creatures. And so we are to, if we are driven by desire for God, then every moment we are going to be seeking to draw close to him, to take hold of the means that he's given us to live in constant intimacy with him. One of the most beautiful things in the tradition is the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Paul Dekimov, uh, a great priest and theologian says, we are not only to pray as a discipline, but we are to become prayer. It is to become like our breath. And so we say the Jesus prayer so frequently, constantly, that we're falling off to sleep with it on our lips. And when we wake up in the morning, what's the first thing on our minds? And the first thing that we say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner our lens for viewing our life, our world, our work, our relationships with our spouses, our children, is this relationship with the Lord. If it's anything less than that, then it's truly lacking. God has offered us everything, and what he desires in return is everything. The model for us should be the woman who, the night before our Lord goes to his crucifixion, before he enters into his passion, anoints him. And in the process, she smashes the jar of ointment. It's a lavish sign of love. Even Judas rebukes her. This could have been sold, and the money for it could have given to the poor. She understood that she had the bridegroom before him, but also before her, but also what he was going through. Not that she knew and understood it fully, but she could perceive intuitively what he was experiencing so she would comfort him in any way she could. And she breaks that jar of nard and pours it over him, filling the room with this perfumed, perfumed oil. This should be the image of our life in Christ and our desire to allow our hearts to be broken and our love to be poured out fully lavishly on others and upon Christ. Okay, so that's my little preface, which probably took up our whole time tonight, but uh, <laughs> if you can hold on to that, I'll be really pleased that the ascetic life is essential and we have a treasure house of spiritual elders to teach us. We could sit at the feet of the greatest of fathers, the Philoclea, which Father mentioned, is the love of the beautiful. Isn't that interesting? That that which is truly beautiful is holiness, is virtuous life. And so we have writers from the fourth to the 15th century, we could sit at their feet every day to be instructed by them. St. John Climacus, as I mentioned, Isaac the Syrian, all of these are available. St. John Cassian are all available to us to nourish us every single day, even if it's a paragraph. St. Paisius, who's an Eastern saint from the Orthodox Church, was lit, led the life of a, a hermit for a period of time. For 25 years, he read only Isaac the Syrian, one paragraph a day. That's how rich and how beautiful it is. 
that we could nourish ourselves, and so there's no excuse. If we could read one paragraph a day and be nourished for the rest of that day, to have this to chew on, to guide us in the spiritual life, then that's what we should be doing. And so what I want to jump into here with you is how it is that we interiorize this for ourselves. And I want to sh show you, and again, if we just get through this, this will be fine. I want to show you first how this has been obscured in the modern mind, and then what it is in truth, what the, uh, how we can look at it in such a way that the full truth is revealed. And so how do we interiorize that ascetic ideal that is established back when the church moves out of martyrdom and into the desert? How can we interiorize the wisdom of the fathers? And this is how it's been obscured over time. And this should make everybody here, at least all those who are not in holy orders, make your ears perk up. The way that it's been obscured is that the idea is that the vast majority of Christians can never achieve this ideal state, can never enter into this perfect prayer, never have their hearts transformed or pray without ceasing, that it's completely out of reach, that you're second tier practitioners of the faith. And often, you will hear things, a kind of clericalism that emerges, not from the clerics, but sometimes from the hearts of men and women. Leave it to the monks and the nuns to do that. We're not desert monks. Let us be about our business of the mundane life. There's nothing mundane about it, of course. There's nothing true about this statement, but this is how it's been obscured, that the spiritual life in the depths, the best and the beautiful is not made for all, but for a select few. And this is nonsense. And the sooner that we move away from this, the better, because then we can begin to be nourished upon what is rightfully ours, and I'm not talking about simply lay people living in the world, but secular priest, Father Val, Father Miron, and myself who live in the world, Father, both of them are parents, so they understand what that reality means and what it entails, what it asks from them, the love, the sacrifice that it asks. But they are still called to embrace and live the gospel in its fullness being married, having a job in the world is not an obstacle to do that. It simply means that in that context, in your particular station in life, in your vocation, you are called to embrace the gospel in its fullness. You are called to love the Lord completely and withhold nothing from him. And in fact, the crosses that those bear in the world are likely better are deeper and heavier than the crosses than some of those who live in the desert. Believe it or not, there are still thousands of monks living in the deserts of Egypt following this, this way of life. So it's not something from the past, it still exists. But again, it's something that is meant for us. But it's been something that this, this idea is crippling to the church as a whole. It's crippling to the majority of Christians throughout the world. I've heard priests or people tell me that priests told them, do not read the Philokalia, do not read St. John Conicus, do not read Cassian. It's too deep, you'll fall into delusion, you'll fall into error. You need to be guided through these readings by a spiritual elder. Okay, fine. But if you are going to tell somebody that, then it's your responsibility as shepherd to be immersed in that reality fully throughout the entire course of your life and your priesthood in order that you might faithfully fulfill your responsibility to your flock. This is one of the things that Christ mourned most of all. When he looked out across the people and saw them as sheep without a shepherd, and one of the gospel tells us that he, he trembles at the sight of it because it's not just seeing sheep wandering around. It's like they've already been torn apart by the wolves, left unprotected and unguided. 
And this is the reality within the life of the church. If we are telling people not to enter into the scriptures, not to enter into the fathers as deeply as they can daily, and not pursuing the, the fullness of, of the life of holiness and these spiritual disciplines fully. You might have to alter them, and this is key, adaptation in your life, in your particular vocation. But everything that's proclaimed in the gospel is meant for, for all of us, not just for a select few. And so to correct this, one of the most important things for us is to understand is that the fundamental principle in our lives is that through Christ, the door has been opened to us to enter into the fullness of the life of the most holy trinity. All of us have been baptized, and in and through that baptism, we enter into the body of Christ. And this means something more than we often imagine. What we are called to is not simply to avoid sin, that's not what it means to be a Christian. That's part of it. But what we are called to is to be conformed to Christ and ultimately deification. What we are called to is a share in the life of the most holy trinity. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful. This is not just spoken to monks in the desert. This is to all of us. And the ability to live this is not by our own strength, not by our own endurance, but what has given, was given to us as little babies. The very treasure house of the kingdom has been opened up to us in order that we might be able to experience the fullness of the life of God. Our great feast as Christian men and women should be the feast of the ascension. And I often get, feel that it gets short shrift among, among Catholics because it's here we see Christ ascend into heaven with the resurrected body. He takes with him what he assumed, what he embraced, our humanity in its resurrected form. But we, the apostles see him and bear witness to the fact that he ascends to the Father in the resurrected body. That means our identity as human beings, our bodiliness in a transformed, transfigured way has now been drawn into the life of the Holy Trinity. This means that we are destined to share in the fullness of the life of our God. That's not just not committing sin or the really big sins. This means opening ourselves up to be transformed by a life, a love that is eternal. It is to share and participate in a love, a peace, a hope that is invincible that again, no one and no thing in this world can ever steal away from us. This all by virtue of our baptism. And so we, we participate in the identity of Christ and all of its fullness. He's priest, prophet, and king. And that means that everyone here as members of the body of Christ, not just father is priest, but you all share in the priesthood of Christ. And so you're all to participate in this sacrifice that is being offered on that altar, but also in the sacrifice of your, your very selves, to allow yourself to be broken and poured out in love for others. You are to be prophet, your very life, not only your words, but every single action, the way that you engage others is to bear a prophetic witness to the truth and to the fullness of the gospel. You are to be king, rule over your own passions, guide and direct your life. Do not submit to the temptation of the evil one, but allow yourself to, to become what you've been made to be, sons and daughters of God heirs of the kingdom of heaven. This is our identity. And I think in our catechesis, if we were able to communicate this, even in a small way, if I could go back and speak to myself, if I could simply communicate these few things, it would have changed my trajectory. At least that's my hope that it would have. Whether or not I would have embraced it is another question. But I think this is, what needs to be preached within the life of the church today. We find ourselves struggling and numbers dwindling in the West, both among Eastern and Western Christians. 
And yet it's often in that which has been humbled that God works the most. We find ourselves living in a culture that is antithetic to Christianity. We are in the minority and we'll never compete with this culture. And so we should stop trying to do so. Making things interesting, flashy, producing fancy programs with beautiful pictures on, on the front of them. It's all meaningless if we are not preaching really what is at the heart of the gospel and offering what is most precious to the faithful. If we are depriving the faithful of this, everything else loses its meaning. Then we become a club that gets together once a week or watches a football game together, has nice meals together. But that does not make us distinctly and uniquely Christian. And it certainly doesn't make us holy. Maybe before we take a little break, I'll mention just one other thing here, and it's the next item on the handout. Uh, don't let th uh, the long word uh, worry you. Eschatological dimension. And what is meant by this is the last things and the end times. And this quickly draws things into perspective for us. People often wonder, when is Christ coming back? If things are getting so bad, what's it going to take? Or when are the end, do you think the end times are coming? And over and over again, I have to say, we're in the end times. These are the end times. The moment that Christ took our flesh upon himself and entered into this world, it ushered in the end age. What is revealed in him is not only unique, but it's definitive. And what has been given to us in him is complete. It's not as though God has something greater to give us than the perfect love of his son who takes upon himself the weight and the burden of our sin, who nourishes us upon his own body and blood, that we might be raised up to share in the life of the Holy Trinity. We are in the end times. God has revealed himself fully. He's pulled back the veil and allowed us to see what is in his own heart, the depth of his love, the depth of his mercy and compassion. It's for us to respond to that reality. And only by understanding that we live in the end times and that we all have to give an account for how we live our lives and we respond to this. It gives a kind of urgency to our lives. That this is something I cannot put off tomorrow. We cannot procrastinate in the faith and there is no static position in the life of the faith. If you aren't moving towards Christ, you're being drawn downstream. You're being drawn along by the spirit of this world. If it's not the Holy Spirit that's animating you, be sure it's another spirit, the spirit of this world or the evil spirit. And so having this clarity about this eschatological dimension is very important. And I want to just very quickly with you, first discuss with you how this was obscured or how it can be obscured. We, we find men and women going off into the desert because they have this urgency within them. They want to be saved. They want to live this life fully. And so monasticism develops. And one of the ways of responding to this reality that we are in the end times is to separate oneself from the world. And so to enter into the desert, to the monastic life. Well, that obviously isn't the answer for all of us. We're not all meant to go to the deserts of Egypt or Palestine or the northern Thebaid, that what we are called to live is here and now, the gospel here and now. And so monasticism always plays an important role for our faith, prophetic. It calls us back to the sense of urgency where we see men and women let go of everything to pursue what speaks to their heart the most, what burns in their heart. But that's not what living in the end times means for us because that allows us again to push it off on to the monastics, to those who have separated from their lives fully. The other distortion and some have tried to use it as a solution, is to Christianize the world. 
and without leaving it. And so to build a Christian city of God. There's that, always that hymn from the 70s that I hate, let us build a city of God. I'm sorry if there's anyone who loves that, but it, it does not resonate with me in, in light of, of this spirituality. But the, the idea behind this is to create theocracies. So to impose the gospel downward all, as law, to so, sort of try to incorporate it within the culture itself and to transform the culture itself. And we have seen how often over the ages this has failed and how it's been disastrous. You cannot compel people into the faith. If anything, you simply drive them away from it. Cardinal Newman said uh, that you cannot even or to think that you could argue a person into faith is absurd as if you think that you could torture them into the faith. People come into the faith because they see the love within our hearts, the faith within us, the desire that we have for, for them. And so we have to move away again from the simply notional to this idea of the lived faith. This is what's compelling. This is what's going to speak to the depths of people's religiosity in order to allow faith to emerge. It's then that people can hear and, and listen to what our faith means and for us to be able to unpack it in all of its fullness. But if the first thing we do is hand them the catechism, forget it. They have to experience within us or within our worship. If they, they see the beauty of our worship, everybody focused on what's going on at that altar. If they see what's going on in the mind and the hearts of men and women, that's what often is the first step for people in, into the faith. And so these are the two ways that this idea of the, this being in the end times has been obscured. It's pushed, it can push people in these two directions, leave the world or try to make th the world Christian by a kind of force or by our activity. But th the real response is to understand that through the incarnation, that the kingdom of God is present and is present and active within, not just in the world, but within our own hearts. The kingdom of God dwells within you. Again, so long as we externalize things, put it out there, the kingdom of God, this is something I need to do, I need to follow these particular practices. It's never going to penetrate to the depths of our hearts or transform our lives. It's only when we understand that God has entered not only into this world by taking our flesh upon us, but he's entered into our very being. He nourishes us upon himself in the Eucharist and we bear his spirit within us. We're temples of God the Most High. And more than that, we are sustained in being. Even if we move to the darkest place in this world because of our sin, God still, still dwells within us. And even if we're in the depth of suffering, we never suffer in isolation because all of it has been embraced and that he, he has entered into it. This is what the kingdom of God is present means, that every fiber of our being, every experience that we have, every conversation that we have with another person is filled with the presence of God. And so we should never look at another person in the same way again. We're at a baptism. There, you should be overcome with a, an overwhelming urge to bow down in front of that little child. Remember that gospel passage about John the Baptist, where Jesus says, among all those born of woman, of, John is the greatest of them all. But I tell you, even the least in the kingdom is greater than he, an infant. Infants, one who cannot even speak, becomes through the waters of baptism greater than the greatest of all those born of women, greater than all the prophets that ever existed because of who they have dwelling within them. A little infant has done nothing to go in their diapers and eat and sleep, but yet they bear within themselves the very life of God in all of its fullness. It's an extraordinary thing that God gives us this as free gift, 
not as something that we've earned, but that we're called to, to embrace. And so if we are living in this eschatological dimension, if we understand that these are the end times, what we are going to experience is an urgency that arises within us, understanding our true identity, our de dignity and destiny in Christ that our life is not limited to this world, what we experience, but what we've been promised is life without end, love without measure, hope without measure. This is what our God has given to us. And again, this draws into focus, and this is why I've spent so much time on it. It draws into focus why we would want to engage in the ascetic life. St. John Chrysostom, in responding to this idea that the fullness of the gospel and the demands of the gospel are addressed to everyone, he writes, when Christ says, when Christ orders us to follow the narrow path, he addresses himself to all. The monastic and the layperson must attain the same heights. Again, he says, those who live in the world, even though married, ought to resemble the monks in everything else. You are entirely mistaken if you think there are some things required of ordinary people and other things of monks. They will have the same account to render. They will have the same account to render. Now, John isn't saying that our life and the structure of our life is to be exactly like that of monks. But what he is saying is that that desire within their hearts, that desire for prayer, to fast, to keep vigil, to study the scriptures is meant for all of us. God came to redeem every one of us. Again, not a few select. So why, why is it that we are letting this be taken away from us? When we have Christ himself and the, these saints who lived us telling us the best and the beautiful are meant for all. The best and the beautiful are meant for all. And we dare not let anyone take that from us, especially ourselves, our lukewarmness, our laxity, our negligence. Part of Lent, is not a 40 days endurance trial. It's meant to be a springboard for us to open our eyes again to what God has given to us and the life that we are called to be living. And so after Lent ends, we should not go back to eating in excess, eating rich foods, or not fasting regularly. And now I know in the East, fast over 150 days a year. So it's, it's still present there, but maybe not present in, in the way that we would want it to be. Again, it's not just restricting our appetites. Christ transforms our understanding, and this will be my last word, Father, before everybody goes to the food table. <laughs> Christ transforms our understanding of, of fasting. Remember the gospel. He's questioned. And about fasting, and they say, John the Baptist disciples fast, and the scribes and the Pharisees disciples fast. Why don't your disciples fast? And you remember his response to them. They have the bridegroom with them. Christ is the heavenly bridegroom, the church is the bride. This is a time for feasting, not for fasting. And then he goes on to say, but there will come a time when the bridegroom is taken away and then they will fast. A unique, distinctive Christian fasting emerges for us from that point on. It becomes rooted in our desire and our hunger for he who is the bread of life. We fast because we experience in our bodily hunger and desire, our hunger and desire for Christ, and that we know that he alone can satisfy within the depths of the human heart. So fasting should not be episodic. Fasting should be year long. One priest called me Father Lent. <laughs> and, and it sort of fits, the title sort of fits, but it's because, again, of what we've become, but who, more importantly, who Christ is for us. We want to experience in our fullness this hunger and desire for him. 
prayer does that for us, fasting does that for us, that we involve the whole self in our pursuit of God. And this is why we practice the ascetic, ascetic life. Not as a test of endurance, but something that prompts us to greater love. And with that word, we'll stop for a little snack. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. You're very welcome. We have food here for you. Vegetables, crackers, waters here. Okay, we had been speaking about this eschatological dimension and not removing from the faithful the sense that the, the best and the beautiful belongs to all and that we are in the end times and so there should be this urgency within our hearts. And again, I don't want this to seem as though it's just coming from me that we see the, the great saints and even the monastics saying it over and over again because they did not want to, them to be, themselves to be seen as living this aberration, that they had entered into this way of life because they felt that God had called them to it and to manifest the gospel in a particular way and to pray and live in a particular way. But they weren't doing something that other Christians aren't called to do. And I just want to share with you something. Do you know Saint Seraphim of Seraph? An Eastern saint, uh, John Paul II had a great devotion to him, but, by the way. And I uh, just have a little paragraph where he, where he was questioned about this, and in particular in light of the contemporary pluralism that we see, I think, in spiritualities that emerge. Uh, where people again begin to pick and choose from various things in order to try to fill that lack. And in his conversation with a, a gentleman, he says this, it is not to you alone that it has been given to understand these things, but through you to the whole world, in order that you may be strengthened in the work of God and be useful for many others. As to the fact that you are a lay person and that I am a monk, there's no need to think of that. The Lord seeks hearts filled with love for God and their neighbor. This is the throne on which he loves to sit and on which he will appear in the fullness of his heavenly kingdom. My child, give me your heart and all the rest I shall likewise give to you because it is in the heart of man that the kingdom of God exists. The Lord hears the prayers of the monk as well as those of a simple lay person, provided both have a faith without error are truly believers and love God from the depths of their hearts. For even if their faith is only a grain of mustard seed, both of them will move mountains. It's a beautiful quote, but it speaks directly, I think, to what we've been talking about here. A grain of faith, the grain size of a grain of, of mustard seed can move mountains. If we have a desire for God in the depths of our hearts and we are seeking to turn to him at every moment, then God takes up that seed of faith and makes it into something that, abu abu that is abundant and transformative. And I mentioned at the beginning of the group, St. Philip Neri saying, if I had 10 truly detached men, I could convert the world. And I would say this, it's, it's been said by some saints, if there's one prayer in a family, it elevates the entire family. And I would say, think that we would say this most of all of married couples, you're one. You've been made one in and through the sacrament. And so if one of you is a prayer and one's going through perhaps a difficult time in their life, the prayer of the one elevates the other. And if they're going through a hard time or carrying the heavy cross, same thing, the prayer, the sacrifices of the other spouse lifts them up, elevates them, and gives them strength because they are acting as one. And so we have to have, learn to have more and more confidence, again, in, in what we've become, our identity, but also the pro power of prayer and the other spiritual practices. St. Tikhon of Zidance says something similar. He says, do not be in a hurry to multiply monks. The black habit does not save. It slims a little bit, but it does not save. 
the one who wears a white habit, the clothing of an ordinary person, and has the spirit of obedience, of humility, of purity, that one is an untonsured monk, one of interiorized monasticism. So here we have St. Tikhon speaking of exactly what we've been talking about, someone living in the world that has interiorized these truths so deeply that they rival the monks in how they are living their life. Uh, it was revealed to St. Anthony that there was somebody living in the city who was holier than he was. That even though that he had gone off to the desert and was living this ascetic life, there was somebody living in the midst of the city doing his daily work who had reached this level of contemplation and purity of heart that was greater than his. And when he, so he goes into the city to find this individual and asks him how he lives his life. And it was simply this remembrance of God that in all that he did throughout the course of the day that he would turn the mind and the heart to God. And this is one of the fundamental ascetical practices that come to us from the Father. Remembrance of God at every moment. To not allow ourselves to be distracted from the one who's created us, who's the source of our life, who gives us light and guidance and helps us to discern the path that is before us. And so Tikhon says, what we want is untonsured monks, not a world filled with those wearing a black habit. Moving on from this is the idea of how is it that we do this? How do we make this adaptation within the world? And I want to begin this with a notion that comes to us from a great Russian writer, Dostoevsky that beauty saves the world. And I mentioned the Philokalia, this compendium of the writings of the fathers, having that title, which means, again, love of the beautiful, and that it makes the connection in our mind that the beauty is not tied simply to what is materially pleasing to us, that, but beauty is found in holiness, in virtue. And so, Writers like Dostoevsky and others will say the most beautiful of all people is Christ. And they aren't speaking about his physical demeanor. They're, they're speaking about the fact that there is within him the perfection of love, the perfection of virtue. And Dostoevsky wrote, in the world there has been only one truly positively beautiful person, Christ. Therefore, the appearance of this wonderful, infinitely beautiful person is in itself an infinite miracle. The entire Gospel of John is devoted to precisely this. In it, St. John declares that the whole miracle is in the incarnation alone, in the very manifestation or emergence of the beautiful. So what God reveals to us in giving us his only begotten Son is that which is truly beautiful. And he reveals to us what it is to be a human being and to live fully in that beauty. And it's not to pursue everything that the world tells us that is valuable or that will make us attractive or feel attractive. It's found by living in this intimacy with God, of living a life of holiness and virtue. And if you've ever come across a saintly person, there's something that emanates from them that speaks to us of that beauty. It was said, to go back to Philip Neri, that there was something about his countenance that, that moved people to faith or drawing them to his heart. His, the Holy Spirit had entered into his heart and expanded it to such an extent that it broke the upper ribs outward and the room would shake when his heart would palpitate when he was overcome by the movement of the Spirit. So anyone who would come into his presence or come for confession, he would often draw them to his breast or by simply being in his presence, their, the passions that were afflicting them would, would be overcome. And so coming into the presence of the saints, we are coming into that beauty of the kingdom, the beauty that saves. And it is this that we want to cultivate within, within our hearts. Gregory of Nyssa writes one of the most beautiful things that I came across here. Hold on for one second. Yeah. 
you alone, in speaking of Christ, or no, speaking of us, you alone are an icon of eternal beauty. For this is the safest way to protect the good thing you enjoy by realizing how much your creator has honored you above all other creatures. He did not make the heavens in his image, nor the moon, nor the sun, nor the beauty of the stars, nor anything else which surpasses all understanding. You alone are an icon of eternal beauty. And if you look at him, you will become what he is, imitating him who shines within you, whose glory is reflected in your purity. Nothing in all creation can equal your grandeur. All the heavens can fit in the palm of God's hand. And though he is so great, you can wholly embrace him. He dwells within you. He pervades your entire being. This is our dignity and our destiny. Why aren't we teaching our children this about understanding where their true dignity and identity is to be found as Christian men and women. It's not in a kind of activism. This is what Christianity has become, I think, in the minds of others, that we are to love, that we are to be the Good Samaritan, that we are to come to the aid of those who are poor and need, and that's true. Our love should compel us to do that. But for the Desert Fathers, the active life was not activism, going out and doing good deeds. The active life was the struggle with the passions, the struggle for purity of heart that then gives us the capacity to love without measure, to love like Christ, to become beautiful as he is beautiful, to allow ourselves then to find within ourselves that capacity that has already been given to us in Christ, to allow ourselves to be broken and poured out and love for others. And so what Gregory of Nyssa is saying here is that despite the beauty of all the heavens that God can hold in the very palm of his hand, it is as nothing in comparison to, to what dwells within the depths of your heart, the fullness of your God. And this is why I said earlier, when we, a child is baptized, we should not see it as a rite of passage or something that we clap about, although clapping is a, a good response. But our joy should be far deeper. It should be what that child has been given. As a priest, to do a baptism is one of the most beautiful things that I'm able to do next to the Eucharist, because it is to be able to give a gift to that child, the only gift that equals and is greater than the love that the parents have for that child. You understand what I mean? It's giving them a gift of love, of eternal love. Again, the only thing that could surpass their love for their little one, because it's giving them God himself who holds back nothing. This ideal that we are to embrace for ourselves and take up again can be obscured as I mentioned, that it, we can think of it as returning back to the monastic ascesis, that we are to do exactly what they do. And that's going to get us in a world of trouble because we, we don't live in the desert. We have not made that commitment. And more importantly, God has not called us to it. Our desert is the city, city a desert. And it is here that we are called to be purified and to live out the gospel. And so it is to be internalized. Your desert is here in this parish, in this city, not living and thinking about and fantasizing about the desert, even though I seem to do that every single day. All of those who follow me on Facebook, whenever I post a cabin in the woods, I'm thinking about escaping <laughs> to my own little hermitage. There's a little bit of self-revelation there. I probably shouldn't do that. but. Uh, but uh, to renew the human psyche from within is what we are called to. There's a, a great Orthodox writer named Herothios Vlachos who wrote a book called Orthodox Psychotherapy. And one of the things that he puts out in, in the book that he describes is that psychotherapy has been misinterpreted throughout these last hundred years because 
especially with the advent of Freud and psychoanalysis and the movement away from the faith, that this whole aspect of who we are as human beings has been put out of the picture our spiritual life, our relationship with God. And so psychotherapy becomes dealing with one's thoughts or one's emotions, where psyche actually means soul. It's therapy for the soul. And so what the fathers of the desert are inviting us to is to enter into this psychotherapy which is the ascetical life, to open ourselves as fully as we can to the healing grace of God, everything that he's given us through the sacraments. It's interesting, the elders would often have their disciples do exactly what Freud developed within psychoanalysis. Every single day, they would come to their elder and reveal to them the thoughts that came to their mind, the urges that they had that they would withhold nothing from the one who is responsible for their salvation and their care. And so they would entrust these things to, to this elder who had this experiential knowledge in order that he might offer some word, some healing balm to guide them along the spiritual life and to bring them healing of a particular passion that they might be struggling with. But for the last hundred years, we've moved from man and woman of faith to psycho or therapeutic man and therapeutic woman. And so you have people s spending millions of dollars. Now I've studied psychoanalysis, I love it. I think it's a sharp instrument. It's made me listen on a far deeper level, but I understand its weaknesses. Our greatest resource as human beings is living in Christ, is living in the way that we've been created to live. And we're always going to find our deepest healing in and through that relationship. That does not mean we don't turn to therapy when it's needed. But we cannot truncate a part of ourselves and think that we are going to experience healing and peace in our life. The only one who can heal us of those deepest wounds we bear is, is the one who promises us the fullness of life and love that will take all that, not only away from us, but he's telling us, I've already taken that for you. Even what you went through, you were not bearing alone. There's not one thing that we go through in this life that we experience in isolation. Any cross that we carry, any abuse that we experience, any hardship that we undergo through, Christ is there and has embraced it for us. It's our being mindful of that reality that we find strength, not only in the spiritual life, but to endure the hardships and the crosses that we, we often have to bear. And so it's <coughs> living this in all of its fullness, and I'll try to wrap things up quickly here. There's a great writer that I've been reading over these past years named Paul Evdekimov. It's a name worth reminding or remembering, and he's written a lot about, about this interiorizing of this life. He himself was a married man, but also a priest, and so he lived in the world and, and actually lived this interiorized monasticism. And what he tells us is that we are to allow the coming of the kingdom into the depths of our hearts. And to allow ourselves to tremble, as it were, before the very gate of heaven, because that's where we've been drawn in Christ. Uh, I believe it was St. John Chrysostom said that, you know, we do well, at least once in our life, to have fear and anxiety about receiving the Holy Eucharist, <clears throat> because it's at that moment that we understand the tremendous mystery that we are being drawn into, and that we should not take lightly that there should be a moment when we are overcome by the enormity of the gift that God has given to us. And so what I want you to take away from this first talk is that human consciousness has forever changed with the advent of monastic spirituality. So it's not as though that existed in one time in history, in Christian history.
This is the spirituality that emerges out of, once the church emerges out of martyrdom and has, there's been a kind of homogeneity in that spiritual tradition that has existed over the centuries. And so what we are doing and seeking to do is to connect ourselves to a living tradition that has brought healing and holiness to millions of Christians throughout the centuries. Uh, we are essentially conservative as Christians, and I'm not speaking politically, that we are not to invent spirituality with every generation, something new, something interesting, something fascinating. We are called to adapt it. There is to be a kind of holy genius that allows us to take hold of this tradition and apply it in our life and live it in our world today in a way that's transformative, that, in a way that speaks to our world. And if ever our, our world needs a word of truth, a word of love, of mercy, it's now. And as I said at the beginning of the talks, what we need is not another talk, not another program. What we need are saints the living presence of this reality in the world. That's what's going to transform our communities, our families, and, and the world around us. And we don't have to invent it anew. It's right, right at our fingertips if we but take hold of it. Thank you and God bless you. And when we move on from here, what I want to do in the coming weeks is talk to you about just five elements, fundamental elements of how we interiorize this. And you can see this at the bottom of your handout, prayer, eschatological maximalism. So living in that sense of the presence of the kingdom here and now, and that we are in the end times. And then how it is that we, we see in the West sort, sort of a, a legalizing of the councils of poverty, chastity, and obedience. But in reality, all of us as Christian men and women are to be living this the spirit of poverty. How is it that we bear witness to the world, that we do not cling to the things of the, of the world as if they are an end in themselves? How is it that we manifest this poverty of spirit, humility to the world? Chastity is not just about sexual purity. It's about our capacity to love without any impediment and give ourselves in love. How is it that we form and shape that within our hearts through the spiritual life? And then finally, obedience. We might not live under an abbot. We might have a very mean pastor who's bossing us around all the time. But nonetheless, we are to cultivate what we see in Christ. Ab adore is, is the root of obedience. It is this capacity to hear the truth and to embrace it, to hear it, and then to have the will to take it up in our, our lives. And so we have to focus on how is it that we internalize what the monks did under their abbot, where they set aside their own will in order to um, embrace the will of another. And for us, how is it that we embrace the will of God, even when he offers us a cross that everything in our heart screams, no or I cannot go there. What will allow us in love to say, yes, Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> we, we've gone quite a bit over time, but if uh, you have any questions uh, that you'd like to put forward, I'd be more than- Question, good. answer, session commentary. Yep. Too much, Father. Your Come on. Your experiences. <laughs> Are any of you familiar with the Philokalia? I'd be sort of curious about that. Have you ever read anything from it? So a couple of here. Anybody read St. John Climacus, The Ladder of Divine Ascent? Tried. Tried. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Well, in every Eastern monastery, it's read every single Lent because of the value of it how deeply it speaks to these realities. Uh, and not to plug myself here, but every Wednesday we have a Zoom group that's reading through the Ladder of Divine Ascent, to which you're all welcome. So, uh, yes. Good. So, what, what was the primary benefit of the Desert Fathers going into the desert living as monks? Right. 
It was in, a, in an extreme way. It was an experiment, and I think that's how they understood it. And it was to separate themselves from all the things that could be an impediment to giving themselves over to God fully. And so in one fell swoop, they let go of connection with family and friends, material goods, security. They went into a desert to engage in a kind of spiritual battle. So they stripped themselves down to the point where they could not project their spiritual problems and their weaknesses upon anything in this world or anybody. It's sort of like what Freud picked up with psychoanalysis. You know why he sits behind the person who's lying on the couch? Do you know the image that Freud didn't sit face to face with them? He listened. And part of the reason that he did that is because, and he had them engage in this free association. So whatever came to mind and whatever came out of their hearts or whatever emerged from their dreams came from them and is projected up onto this blank screen because they would know nothing about the analyst, nothing about his or her life or personal history. And so what a person begins to see very clearly in that process of psychoanalysis is that internal narrative. What we see in the fathers who precede him by 2,000 years is the same kind of thing. They enter into the desert and there they begin to see that the battle is within. And when you in the desert and you have nobody around you can get fiercely anger at a piece of wood because you tripped over it, you know that the passion of anger still has a grip on your heart. And so they entered in the, into the severe kind, this severe kind of setting to put themselves to the test to do spiritual battle, but also that they might give themselves over to, to love Christ fully. They did see this movement in, in the church taking place where it was becoming part and parcel of the culture and accepted. And so a kind of lukewarmness began to creep in. And so it was seeing that that drove them into the desert. And what, what emerges there, what God gives us, is this lasting legacy. This is our patrimony. It drives me nuts whenever the Orthodox will say, you're reading our readings, quit posting the Our Saints. Well, these were writers from the you know, fourth to the 15th century. This is, our, this is our patrimony. This belongs to us as well. And it certainly belongs to these Eastern Rite Christians. And this is, this, is what's going, this is what's going to save the church. This is what's going to give it what it needs. And it's going to emerge. Uh, the renewal of the church is either going to emerge through suffering, through persecution, the cross, or it's going to emerge from the, uh, it's going to emerge from the presence of saints. Those who, who enter into and embrace the gospel like the fathers did. Pope Benedict said that it would, that sort of thing could happen. That right. Would the, the church would shrink. Members. This kind of stuff right. like the mustard seed. I had a really interesting experience. I, I became entered into the Eastern Rite in the summer, and the rectory was a mess, and the carpet was really bad. And do you know Mr. Molyneux, who runs Molyneux Carpeting, it's a big chain here. I happened to know him, so I texted him. And I said, I don't really wanna lay this burden on the parish, doesn't have money, can you help me out here a little bit? And he said, of course, you know, and he was very gracious and, and helped us out there. But at the end of our conversations, he said, he said something incredibly beautiful and insightful for a, a Latin Rite, Christian. He says, I think the Eastern Rites, church, Eastern Rite churches are going to be the salvation of the church as a whole. They're smaller, they're poorer, humbler, more docile, that is teachable, and so more incapable of infusing life in, into the church. But that is if those who are Eastern Rite take hold of their legacy the legacy of the fathers, take hold of their patrimony and, and live it. But I think he's right. It was an incredible insight that he saw, he saw, we have right here in the church what we often neglect. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. There can be this territorialism among Christians and competitiveness. 
And to think that the Eastern rites would be seen as in, comp in competition with Latin rites is laughable. There are like 1.4 billion Christians throughout the world, and all the Eastern rites together make up 0.5% of that. <laughs> But I think it's what St. Philip Neri said. If I had 10 truly detached men, I could convert the world. You could have this small little group of Christians that are rooted in that which was, the, 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 the re, this spiritual reading for the Desert Fathers was the scriptures. They were seeking to give themselves over to the Christ fully and to live the gospel fully. And if we, if we are entering into this, and you'll see it when you read them, it's like the gospel comes to life, not only in what they say, but the way they live their lives. They, they become living icons of the gospel, living icons of Christ. And that's what we are called to become as well. So to go back to them gives us a lens through which to read the scriptures too, in a way that is not watered down. There have been so many times where I've, I've read the climb and I'll step back and I think, oh my gosh, there was like a bucket of cold water jarring where every fiber again in my being says, no way. If you read his writings on penitence or obedience, it's shocking. But what surprises me, and as a former Latin rite, you know, I'd read these gospels and you get to the end of them and Christ would say, and do not resist one who is evil. The gospel of the Lord. And everybody says, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And I think, how can we say that unless we have uh, domesticated the gospel, that we've heard it, it's become so familiar to us that we can hear Christ say to us, do not resist one who is evil, and, and shout out joyfully, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, as if it's the most natural <laughs> thing in the world. And it isn't natural, it's supernatural. And that's what we have to get into our mind. It's not by, <coughs> excuse me, it's not by sh sheer strength of will. It's not by being a good person. It's by becoming Christ, by having him dwell so, so deeply within us that his virtue becomes our virtue. His strength becomes our strength. That's the only way that we can live the gospel. And that's the only way to live a, a holy life.